You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Yes, indeed. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. And tonight, uh, your boy here doesn't have, have as much energy as he usually does. I feel very tired, very lethargic. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a story or two from this African myth and legends book. Um, this book has started becoming valuable now. Several listeners who read it to their children, read it for themselves. It's becoming valuable in the curriculum that we've been talking about. Uh, so yeah, so look for some interesting things to come about based on this hair uh, novel. Uh, by the way, um, just a reminder uh you guys can join our discord server the bit of medicine podcast on discord where you could either join as a curriculum writer or you could just join as a fan of the podcast you can be a podcast fan just enter the server give a shout out let's let, let, let us know you're there and which role you're there for and we'll um We'll make sure to get you added in there. Also, if you're a fan of the show and you want to see the show do bigger and better things, uh, and, and you have the understanding that, that right now, uh, it's really one person doing everything. Uh, if you want to, if you want to uh, join the Discord and say, "Hey, I'm here to to help produce the show." Uh, there are things I can definitely get some help with behind the scenes. Right, so if you want to join us um, to be a, a podcast, you know, producer. I see in the chat room we got some early activity. I see Nikki Ran has come back, uh, second time in a row. Nikki Ran, nice to have you here. Uh, I hope that means that you enjoyed your last time here. Uh, Nikki Ran just also joined the Discord as well. So you guys, make sure you hop on and join the discord i just posted the link in the uh chat room remember this is a live stream show so um you know i'm i'm speaking in real time here i just posted the link to the discord in the chat room i also just shouted out and said peace to nikki ren uh, who's returned, like I said, who recently joined the Discord. And uh, guys, I want to remind you before we go any further, I want to remind you that this show is a part of a podcast network. Please, please, please support the other folks on the podcast network. The podcast network is called KWAZ Radio. Um, they're in the chat as well. <clears throat> you know, follow their YouTube channel um some changes are gonna happen soon there so follow the youtube channel click the bell to be notified when new content is posted at kwaz radio like i said there's other shows on the network and i want you guys to in fact check out the other shows this is dax you tune into the harsh reality podcast providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community only on kwaz radio Peace family, this is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. 
You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. And also make sure to check out the Queen's Council. The Queen's Council has been putting out some work lately. Check out the Queen's Council as well. All right. With all of that said and done, all of that business taken care of, uh, let's get into the reading tonight. I'm probably not going to be here too, too long, you know, but uh, I'm here. I hope you guys enjoy the readings to follow. So the first story we're going to read is Jackal and the Trusting Light. This is a, a Zosa story. As you know by now, this book is reprinting um, stories that were typically of the oral tradition, right, for various peoples and geographic areas of the continent. As I've said before, it's a great way of building a curriculum, particularly for early learners, right, around stories. A lot of times these African stories talk about different foods they eat, uh, eat and drink, uh, it talks about different types of trees, different types of animals, different uh, traditions of the people, etc. And you could use those items to uh, to build curricula uh, around, right? Um, you'll be seeing some from me very soon. Uh, some of the work I've been doing in, in this regard. So, Jackal and the Trusting Lion. A Zosa story. Aha, said Jackal, leaving his den on the top of a rocky outcrop. There's Lion. It looks as though he's out hunting. A good time for some fun and games, Jackal thought as he clambered down the rock face. Quietly, Jackal slinked behind Lion imitating the bushy mane lion's cat-like walk as he ambled through the long grass. Suddenly, lion roared and caught black, black-backed black jackal so by surprise that he stopped dead in his tracks. Lion swung around quickly and said, Oh, it's you again, jackal. Jackal took a few timid steps backwards. Who the scarce lion, and I have four young pups at home, who are starving. Lion felt sorry. Lion felt sorry for Jackal and said, come and hunt with me, Jackal. If we catch a small buck, you can have it. But if we, t- if we take a large antelope, it's mine. Agree, the abjack. So Lion and Jackal went hunting together, Jackal trotting a few steps behind Lion. What's that, asked Jackal, spotting movement in the trees ahead. Eland, whispered Lion, stopping to observe the buck. They could see Eland's short spiral horns through a gap in the tree's foliage as the buck tore leaves from the branches. Lion stalked his prey, crouching low in the undergrowth and then leapt into action. He took the Eland with some ease and then standing proudly over his victim, Turned to Jackal and said, go home and tell my cubs to come and eat. I'll continue hunting in the meantime. All right, grumbled Jackal, slinking rather reluctantly off into the bush. He kept glancing over his shoulder, and when he saw a lion disappear over the hill, he changed direction and crept off to his own den. My family is starving, wailed Jackal as he climbed the rocks. I'd be a fool not to tell my own hungry pups about it. Children, cried Jackal, I have made a wonderful kill. Come and get all of the spoils I have left for you. That's a nice picture right there. Back in the bush, Jackal kept guard while his little pups took the meat. Carefully, they climbed back up to their home among the rocks. Uh -uh, Sorry. Although Lion continued to hunt that day, Jackal didn't see him again. When Jackal grew tired of waiting for him, he went home to find his pups full and satisfied. 
Later that day, Lion returned home and found that his cubs had been lulled to sleep by the warm afternoon sun. As soon as he lay down in the shade beside them, they woke up. Children, did Jackal come and tell you to go and get the Elan meat? No, said the children. We are starving. Lion was furious. He stood up, left his family, and ran towards Jackal's den. When he crossed the little stream near Jackal's house, he could hear the young Jackal cubs yelling and frolicking in their home on top of the rocks. He tried to climb the rock up to the den, but the Jackal pups threw, uh, threw rocks down at him. His paw couldn't grip the smooth rock and he kept slipping. I'll wait in the bushes beside the stream, thought Lion. Sooner or later, Jackal will want a drink. But the sun was hot, and Lion began to doze. He did not see Jackal as he approached the stream. But Jackal saw Lion partly hidden among the reeds and immediately turned tail and ran. The swish of his feet in the long, dry grass woke Lion, and he quickly leapt up and gave chase. Rascal, cried Lion. Why didn't you tell my cubs? But Jackal heard no more. Seeing a small hole under a tree, Jackal crouched down low, dived into it head first, and was almost clear when Lion caught up with him. He grabbed the end of Jackal's strong black tail and pulled it as hard as he could. Don't think you're holding my tail, wailed Jackal. It's a root from this tree. Lion was holding the tail so tight and the pain was so great that Jackal had to try very hard not to yell. Nonsense, said Lion. You can't fool me. Then take a sharp stone and beat my tail with it, urged Jackal. If you draw blood, it's my tail. If you don't, it's a root. How clever, thought Lion, wondering where he could find a sharp stone. I'll prove him wrong. But when Lion let go of Jackal's tail, Jackal slid further and further into the hole, just as he did when he was using Aardvark's abandoned burrow. When Lion returned with his stone and found Jackal gone, he flung it down on the ground. I'm not being fooled that easily, he roared angrily. I'll wait for Jackal to come out of the hole. After many hours, Jackal grew bored, lying alone in the cold, damp hole. Besides, it was almost dark and he wanted to return to his family. He crept to the entrance and peeped out with his long ears alert. No sign of lion, he thought, I'm safe. He wiggled to the surface and when he stepped out into the dusk, the sound of cicadas chirping around him, Jackal yelled loudly, I can see you, lion. I know you are hiding right there. Lion lay still, not moving until Jackal had moved just a little closer to him. Then lion leapt up and gave chase with great powerful strides. And he was just about to catch him when Jackal sprung up onto the rock that led up to his den. I'll get him, Lion said to himself. I'll wait until he goes out hunting again. And so Lion waited and waited and waited, and it wasn't long before Jackal was driven out to hunt by his hungry pups. Lion watched as Jackal sneaked out of his den and climbed down the rocks. Quietly, Lion padded up behind Jackal without him knowing and let out a loud roar. Jackal could not escape and cringed in fear before the powerful beast. The golden mane lion was just about to spring on Jackal when Jackal said, wait lion, look at what I see over there in the shadowy light, a pair of bush, bush buck. The thought of a buck, of, of a, the thought of a buck immediately diverted lion's attention and he looked over at the bush buck. You can help me hunt them. Just wait here, lion, and I'll go around to the other side and chase them so that they run towards you. Good idea, said lion, crouching down on his haunches, hidden by the long grass. I'm ready. And from his den at the top of the rocky crevice, Jackal watched as lion lay in wait for the bush buck. Another day of fun and games, said Jacko, smugly. Right? So clearly, you know, when you listen to that story, you should be familiar with 
uh with basically the, like the stereotype of what the jackal is playing jackal is playing uh playing the ass but he's also playing um the role of the trickster right and a lot of african stories that have come over to this side of the world you know in the caribbean and even in america in the south a lot of these stories uh sorry about that a lot of these stories are uh, uh you know uh use the 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 trickster archetype in those stories right so in the book here they're going to give you a little spiel a little talk on the trickster the trickster appears frequently in african folk tales he maneuvers situations to his own advantage and is able to trick not only buck but the mighty king of the beasts, the lion too. And yet with all his cunning, he's never able to trick the humble tortoise, who always shows great wisdom and understanding. The role of the deceitful and greedy trickster is often played by the wily jackal. And he's traditionally treated with suspicion and distrust. Right? Let's go to another story. Um, this one's called the hole in the wall. Uh, she was tall and slender and with skin that shone like water gleaming on deep brown rocks. Wrapped in a cloak of rusty brown, she sat on the edge of the cliff looking down at the lagoon below. It was safe water fed by the little river and protected from the sea by a great curve of rock. It, it was a wall, just like the walls her people made to shelter the mouths of their homes, only theirs was of woven reeds. This was of hard, dark rock. The sea outside was there to high tide. She could hear the waves crashing impatiently. Her people were a land people. They spared fish in the river, and they swam in the lagoon where giant milkwood trees with their dark, shiny leaves and comforting shade crowded the water's edge. Long ago, they had decided that the sea was cruel and dangerous. They feared the pounding waves and the singing spray. They knew how the cold, cold water could, er could surge up over the rocks and snatch land people into an unseen death. We do not go there, they told her again and again. Beware the sea people. They are born of the salt spray and they are as cruel as the sea. They envy us because we rule the land and the sunny pastures. The tide is full, they come up, of, come up, up out, out of the sea to graze their cattle on the cliff tops. If they see you, they will catch you and take you away. But she found the sea endlessly attractive. Every wave was different. Every changing mood of the swelling water hinted of a greatness which was far beyond the power of man. That was why the last time the moon was eaten away, she had gone by herself to the shore of the full sea, beyond the wall of the rock. Out of the wave had come one of the sea people. He had been strange to look upon, as tall as she was, with silky flowing hair like the waves. His eyes were sea blue, and his bones gleamed white beneath his pale skin. He moved in a smooth flowing way. He was kind. He had talked with her, saying how he admired the dark beauty of her skin. She listened as if in a trance. He had watched her often, he said, and admired her from afar. Now he had come because he wanted to have her as wife. Sounds like a white boy cupcaking with a African beauty, right? And here's the picture. 
Her father had been angry. Sorry, her father had been angry when she told him. We do not trade our young daughters with the sea people, he shouted. What sons will you produce from the sea to hunt for me in my old age? Such a marriage is unthinkable. No, you shall see him no more. Never mention him again to me. But she had. She had slipped away in the dark of the night and met with her sea love. My father refuses to let me marry one of your kind, she told him. He had wailed and tossed his shining head and grieved. He had told her to wait until the tide was high. She must watch and see what he would do to prove his love to her. But she must stand a safe distance from the shore. So that was what she was doing. As the sun dipped low and red beyond the wall of the rock, she watched. Nice piece of artwork right here. Was she imagining, or were those thin, willowy figures on the top of the rock? What were they bringing with them? It seemed bulky and long and unknown. Her seaman's warning was forgiven. Oh, sorry, it was forgotten. She stood excited and started to run down towards the lagoon. There were shouts behind her. The village folk had sensed something strange was happening, and they followed her. It was a huge fish that the sea people were carrying, an enormous sea serpent with green glittering scales and a mighty head. Down to the lagoon they flowed into the water, and then to her despair, not towards the shore where she stood appealing, uh, but towards the high curve of rock. What were they doing? The huge fish was battering as the rocks with its was battering at the rock with his head. You know, uh, in amongst the white splashes, chunks of rocks were falling. The fish was carving a hole through the cliff itself, so that soon the sea outside and the lagoon within would be joined together. Right, I'm tired. While her father and her family and the village people stood beside her and watched with excitement and growing terror, the fish carved a passage to the open sea. A great spot of water gushed through with all the force of the tide behind it, and on the wave came hundreds of sea people stinging, uh, singing and shouting and waving their long arms with joy. At the front of them was the man who had come to claim her. He rode the wave right to her feet, stretched out his arms, and she moved to join him. Then as the wave retracted, foaming and frothing its pleasure, she went with the people of the sea, back through the hole in the rock wall. And the villagers never saw her again, though they searched and cried and waited in hope. They say that for months afterwards, her family would wake from dreams which seemed to say that their daughter was happy to need the sea. Her husband was a sea prince and his people were so kind. But the village folks scorned such dream messages. Of course the sea people are cruel, they said. See how they have stolen our beautiful maiden from us and given us no cattle in exchange. That is a tale that the Zosha people tell. Mm -hmm. They say that the sea went on eating away at the carved rock wall until it no longer formed a barrier between the sea and the river mouth. Only the central piece of hard dolerite rock remains. They call the place uh, Essikaleni, which means the place of the sound. They say that on the nights when the trade, when the tide is high, the sea people can still be heard above the noise of the waves, streaming through the hole in the wall in their search for a bride. So now we get to the part in the book where they tell us about some aspect of the story. The aspect that they're going to tell us about here is the hole in the wall. 
right? Again, some nice artwork here too. This impressive arch was named in 1823 by the British by a British survey ship, uh, the Barracuda, which was surveying the coastline. Boastful swimmers have attempted to go through the hole, but the incredible force of the waves makes this almost impossible. A trooper of the Cape Mounted uh, Rifles tried it to win a bottle of whiskey and a bet, but was never seen again. So the locals will tell you. Fragments of ships, of ships wrecked on our part of the wild coast are often found in the quiet sheltered shore pools. So that's an interesting story built around an actual geographic area. All right? And that's why I say you gotta embrace these stories and embrace them in a manner where you're gonna use the knowledge, right? You're gonna apply the knowledge in different fields, different areas, right? So you definitely wanna uh, learn to embrace these stories. I'm gonna read this one last story for the night. Again, super tired. Uh, I could barely keep my head up and eyes open. Uh, let me take a quick station ID break. I'll be back on the other side. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Okay, and we're back. Uh, let's take a quick session ID break. And also a reminder, there's the Queen's Council Podcast. Check out her show as well. Uh, yeah, so this is the last reading here. I want to thank you guys who joined me. Uh, I know Nikki Wren was in the chat room. Uh, a few other folks. I want to thank you guys for joining me. I want to remind you that we have a Discord server. Of course, it's free to join. Hop on. You know, let us know what you want to do, how you want to help. Do you want to work on the curriculum? Do you want to just be there as a fan of the podcast? Do you want to be a podcast producer? You know, someone who could help uh, with some things behind the scenes. Right? And that's if you care about the podcast, you want to see it grow. All right. So let's get to this final story tonight. Uh, where am I? Yeah. Van Honks and the Devil. Which I, I'm guessing this is also a Zosa story as well. Captain Van Honks gazed up at Table Mountain. From the stope of his house in Cape Town, he couldn't see the clump of trees on the saddle of Mountain with a sharp point of Wind Mountain, as it was called, was joined to the main flat topped built of the mountain. He couldn't see them, but he knew they were there. It was a long, hard climb to his favorite seat under those trees. When he was younger, he could have climbed up there easily, but he didn't have time to spare in those days. He had been far too busy sailing the seven seas and doing some sly pirating wherever he could. Those have been grand days. Where are you? Uh, came a screaming voice which he knew far too well from inside the house. He was here, of course, sitting on the stope of the house in the sunlight, feeling his, in his pockets for a pipe to fill with his favorite tobacco. I found another of your evil smelling pipes. Under the bed, he held the voice even angrier. So that was where he had hidden it. Van Honks was glad it hadn't been lost. Still, he did wish he had found the pipe himself rather than his wife. He ambled inside to face the whirlwind. Don't think you're coming in here, shrieked his wife. Here's your pipe. Take it away. Far, far away. 
and I'm not having the filthy smell of tobacco smoke in my clean house. I've told you that before. Van Hong sighed. Why was it that his wife disliked the fine scent of pipe tobacco? It was one of the great discoveries of mankind. Tobacco soaked in rum had a fragrance all its own. Even the cargo he had captured on the seas of the Spanish main had never smelt as sweet. He captured a missing pipe, grabbing his wooden keg of tobacco and a flask of wine and escaped outside. This sort of thing happened too often. Uh, in the winter, he in the winter he would head for the nearest tavern where he could enjoy a game of dice. In summer, as it was then, he preferred a walk up the mountain where the air was quiet. Toiling up the rocky path made Van Hunks think on things such as having married a wife with such a sharp tongue and a poor appreciation of tobacco scent. Then as the whole spread of Table Bay came into view before his feet, Van Hunks started examining the ships at anchor. How many of you ladies listening have significant others that smoke? How, how, um, how inviting are you with your significant other that smokes cigarettes? Especially if you don't smoke. From that, it was easy to let his memory slip back into his own sailing days. The deafening broadsides of cannon and flashing cutlasses, the looting and sinking and the chest of gold, he chuckled uh, wickedly to himself. There had been a time when he was the terror of the seas, a pirate as fair as old Nick, the devil himself. There had been good company in those days, thought Van Hunks, as he made his way towards the rock, where he usually sat to have his uninterrupted smoke. But what was this? Someone else had reached a spot before him and was sitting on his rock under the shade of his tree, a stranger wrapped up in a flowing black cloak, cloak and a dark forked beard on his wide brim black hat. Good morning, Captain Van Hunts, said a welcoming voice. A lovely day for a smoke. You know my name? Gasped Van Hunts, who was out of breath as well as amazed. Oh, I know everybody, said the stranger, especially someone as famous and fair as yourself. Van Hunts allowed himself to be flattered. At my time of life, he replied, I prefer to make friends rather than, rather than enemies. Will you join me in a pipe of tobacco? This dark mixture is the way I like it. It's right to my own taste, though I doubt if anyone else could smoke as much of it as I do. He patted his tobacco keg with affection. That sounds a little like a boast, said the stranger, and his eyes seemed to flash fire. Or was it just a glint of reflected light? Where I come from, we smoke a good deal. I think I could match you pipe for pipe and still have breath for more. A wager, shouted Van Hunks excitedly. Will you take a bet on it with me? Stranger smiled, tilted his hat back just a little, and somehow that smile sent a shudder through Van Hunks. His face was as dark and weathered as Van Hunks's own, and the mouth twisted in a cruel sneer. A wager indeed, let's say your soul against a ship full of gold that you cannot outsmoke me. So we see the white boy here talking to the other white boy, um, right, in this picture. John agreed, Van Hunks, without really listening. Uh, in his experience, there was no model man who could beat him in a smoking contest. He emptied the contents of his rum-scented keg onto a flat rock and divided the, the, the tobacco into two equal heaps. There, sir, he offered, help yourself. The dark stranger produced a curiously shaped pipe from a deep pocket and filled it with, with tobacco. Then while Van Hunks was striking flint against steel from his tinderbox to light his own pipe, the stranger seemed to, con to conjure sparkling fire out of midair with a snap of his fingers. Smoke started to curl from both pipes. The contest had begun. A long, long silence followed. 
just occasionally a throat was cleared or a pebble was stirred as one or another of the two smokers reached for another pinch of Van Hunks's tobacco. The sun hid itself behind Lion's Head, voyaged around the world and reappeared to welcome another day far away beyond the peaks of the Hottentots Hall. Yeah, the Hottentots Holland. Its rays lit up the growing cloud of smoke wreathed around Table Mountain, for Van Hunks and the stranger were still sitting there smoking. The cloud poured over the edge of the mountain, where the wind greeted it with delight. In her Cape Town cottage, Van Hunks's wife latched the diamond pan windows tight shut. What a southeaster! She explained. She, uh, she exclaimed and wondered, just for a moment, what had become of her husband. So she only wondered for a moment what, what, what became of the guy. Uh, he was busy enjoying a smoke as satisfying as he could ever remember. In a fit of unusual generosity, Van Hunks offered his flask of wine to the stranger. He was quietly amused to see how eager the stranger was to accept the drink. Throat dry? Asked Van Hunks with a smile. The stranger said nothing, but he coughed a little and eased his black hat back from his red, sweating forehead. As the day continued and the clouds of smoke poured increasingly down the mountainside, even Van Hunks began to feel hot and sweaty. But by then, the figure beside him had turned first red, then pale, then green with sickness. The moment came when he fell helplessly off his rock seat. Fire and brimstone, he exclaimed. My lungs are alight. And as he lay back, his hat slipped off his head. There, clear for Van Hunks to see, were two sharp pointed curling horns. Your old Nick himself, gasped Van Hunks. The devil in disguise. Then the coat, hat, and boots disappeared in a flash of lightning. Beside him stood the ruler of hell with forked tail and cloven hooves. I've won, crowed Van Hunks. Now for my reward, I've beaten the devil himself. But the dark gentleman was not like to be beaten, does not like to be beaten. Thunder rolled, the clouds were closed in. When the wind next blew the clouds apart, there was nobody there. Only a scorched path of turf around the rock where Van Hunks had been sitting. Believe it or not, that is the tale. Ever since then, thick white cloud lies like a tablecloth on Table Mountain, and the southeaster blows through the town below. Folk look up and say, in each, and say to each other, see, old Van Hunks and the devil are at it again. What was once known only as Wind Mountain it's now always called Devil's Peak. So, you know, before I read um, the, the, the focus point at the end of the story, you know, I get the, um, I get the feeling this story is written about by some boss or you know, white South, South Africans or something, right? So, you know, do with that what you will. You know, that, that story really didn't move me that much. Uh, I seen a chat room, Nikki Rennan is still, is still around. She said, I'm not, can't stand the smell. I guess she was re re referring to my question about, you know, if you're a smoker, oh no, well, if, if you're not a smoker, can you stand, you know, your husband or, or significant other being around the house smoking like the woman in this story? couldn't tolerate and Nikki Rand seems not to be able to tolerate it as well she can't stand the smell okay uh so let's um talk about the focus point in the story and then we'll call that a night so the focus point is the table mountain it says this flat top mountain flanked by devil's peak and lion's head is probably the most famous landmark in South Africa. Its highest point, Maclair's Beacon, is 1,113 meters above Table Bay 
the sandstone mountain is some 2,600 uh, is home to 2,000 different species of indigenous flora. Climbers have found that 350 different ways to the top, though most visitors prefer to use the cableway built in 1929, which lifts over a quarter of a million people each year to the top. South of the Table Mountain, the Cape Peninsula stretches down to Cape Point, the most stately thing in the fairest cape which the voyaging Sir Francis Drake ever draw. Oh, I'm sorry, ever saw. Jeez. So yeah, so again, you're talking curriculum. You are, you 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 can go in and look up these different species of of, of indigenous flora and have the folks learn. You know, the the early learners learn about these different flora. What are the medicinal, right? Right. What are the commercial uses of some of the flora? Right. So. You know that that you know even though the story to me was trash uh there's some things you could take from it you can study the geography right the people in that area right the customs the language etc 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 right uh i see we got fabo in the uh <clears throat> chat PCU Thabo, good to see you again. Uh, Thabo's asking, or, 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 or yeah, he's, he's asking, uh, he was wondering, how was that an African story? You see, this is the problem when you, this is the problem when you lose. When you lose, the winner can do you anything. Even tell part of your story. Or make parts of his story your story. And so what has happened here, again, this is, this is like in South Africa. So this is about those white folks who are conquerors down there. And this is one of their stories, clearly. Because as we know, as we've learned over the years, like Africans didn't have um, words for devils and stuff like that. Like there wasn't a concept of of heaven and earth and God and the devil and all that kind of stuff. So it just shows you like this was a this is one of the African quote unquote African missionaries telling a story or the or the quote unquote African uh, you know the white pirates or whatever it was these people were right and so you, but you know I, I I did not know that ahead of time you know so we. We, re we read a trash story, you know, that happens sometimes. Uh, in the future, hopefully we get back to more African stories. Whenever I pick up this reading again, I'm gonna start with the seven magic birds, right? Seems like it's a Zulu story. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we get back to our Africanness, right? In the upcoming stories. Anyway, guys, uh, you probably could tell by now I'm struggling through, starting to get a headache now, too. Uh, it's been good. I appreciate you guys in the chat room. Uh, make sure, if you haven't already, join the Discord. If you haven't already, make sure to um, like this video. All right, for all of you guys who've who are here, make sure to like the video. If you're not subscribed, make sure to subscribe. If you did all those things, make sure you click the bell. The bell, by clicking the bell, you'll be notified when I'm on. All right? Oh, I see the pro-black perspective is here. Uh, it says, thanks for the reading. Uh, no problem. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for listening. All right? So until next time, guys, that's been... The latest episode of the Bill Madison Podcast. I will talk to you guys on Saturday. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. 
If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine. <laughs>